It's time for the tactics meeting. Episode 10, Oil Spill Trajectory Modeling, with Jen West's Chief Oceanographer, Dr. Jerry Galt. In this episode, we're going to talk about the early days of oil spill modeling, how he came to use the Apple II to run Awesome, later GNOME, and the evolution of Web GNOME. So stay tuned. Well, thanks for coming on and, and doing this. I've been a big fan of GNOME for many, many years, and I've used a pirated uh, file that I think you or Ren uh, wrote for BP, maybe for Arco years ago to provide data for the northern, for Straits of Georgia and Rosario. Um, we've, we've used that a bunch of times after the fact. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I'm pretty sure I still have it, but now I, now I come to use Web Gnome, and I I actually use it all the time. I used to use have access to Oil Map years ago. Uh, NJ Resources had a license for for Oil Map, and it it had some interesting features, but I still prefer Gnome, and of course it's free, so. <laughs> I was using it. That's a plus. <laughs> yeah, it's a super plus, and and I was using it to develop a trajectory for a a drill that WISMIC, the Washington State Maritime Cooperative, is going to do in May. That Gen West is going to participate in as, as well, and uh, it worked. I wanted it to do a a trajectory where I had uh, an on ongoing release between multiple points, and it did a great job. It's created the ugliest trajectory I've ever seen. It oils in four counties. It's all over the place. Yeah, it, it happens sometimes. Yeah. But by the way, in real life, that happens sometimes too. Um, I was talking to Ren a little bit earlier, but I, I've i now been working on uh, this problem for 45 years. And when I started in the 70s, uh, the way computers worked was you took a card deck and you took it to the computer center and they put it in a bin and ran it overnight when the university computer wasn't doing their business. And um, then you got the answer back in a big folded paper the next day. And we were trying to figure out how to use computer assist in figuring out where oil was going to go. So uh, a couple of things happened. I believed in in personal computers and that we couldn't possibly survive off a mainframe computer at University of Washington for forecasting because it was we didn't have the right priorities. And in addition to that, we had to operate over a phone line. And the only phone line capability we had was a silent 700, which is 200 baht. <laughs> so uh, that wasn't very much throughput. So anyway, working with my first uh, portable computer, which was a PDP-8, and about the size of a phone booth. and. Um, it turns out it was an okay computer for its time, but uh, it wasn't portable. You could put it in a crate and ship it, but every time you shipped it, the uh, reader heads on the disk drives got out of alignment and had to go back to the factory to get recalibrated. Oh. So uh, that made it not portable. I started looking at the problem of of how to do near shore where geometry is important. And basically most of the people's concern at that time about oil spills was beaching. Nobody was really doing anything at sea anyway. People talked a little bit about skimmers, but none of them worked and uh, they didn't, uh, didn't do very well. And uh, so the real forecast issue was when's it gonna hit the beach? And so I started working on digitizing shorelines and 
using bathymetric data. And the data source we had at that time was paper charts. So we got a big digitizer and then we would able to trace around the shoreline and digitize it while we were going. And then we'd pick off some points and define the bathymetry. And it turns out if you have perfectly arbitrary points, the only grid system that, that uniformly works is triangles. And so I started working with making triangle routines. And again, that was 45 years ago. The first one I came up with, we, and actually there's a couple of us came up with it. We ran on the PDP-8 and it only took two days to, to handle something like 150 data points. And just, just two days. Two days. And uh, that didn't seem to me very great, but on the other hand, it gave us something to experiment with. And so I then did a whole lot of research, including stuff at Boeing about how they were doing flow codes, things like that. And finally, uh, I uh, ended up sneaking out and buying on my own an Apple II. <laughs> one of the little desktop things. And I bought it under the pretext I was going to give it to my kids, but I kept it for six months first. <laughs> and it had a C compiler and I started working on new codes and I actually got the uh, triangle code to run in about an hour. Wow. On the Apple II. And it was portable. And so that was encouraging. And then uh, Glenn Watabayashi, who worked with me, took a look at it. And we agonized over the code. And he finally said, well, you know, let's not write this in C. Let's translate the code into machine language. So we ran it in native Apple II uh, machine code. And it took him a month or two to convert all the routines to that. But we astounded ourselves because it ran the same problem in three minutes instead of an hour. Wow. And now we're talking capability. And so at that point, I gave my kids the Apple II. And we bought one for work. <laughs> so you'd done a proof of concept, showed that the hardware was worth the price. Yes. and. Uh, so then sent, sent Steve Wozniak a thank you letter. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, again then actually went operational at that point. And it turns out we could digitize a strange area as, as long as we had a chart because they had data points for bathymetry and a shoreline. And we actually could to a strange area in something like three hours. So if somebody would call us in the middle of the night, if we had a chart, we could then actually come up with a model in about three hours. Were you working for NOAA at the time or were you? Yes. Okay. I was in something called a modeling and simulations studies, math. All right. Well, how did you? Come to work for, for Noah, you. Oh, you... well, that's a, another long story. But actually, when I, when I graduated with my uh, doctorate, I got a job and I was on the faculty at Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. And among other things, when I was down there, I did computer modeling, all of big computer kind of stuff. And I was also on the uh, university's computer resource board. So I was making recommendations and about languages and programs and what equipment we should buy and all that sort of stuff. So I got into computer science management and I also had a degree in applied math. So 
that sort of was a natural fit. I was down there for four years, did a lot of work with the uh, systems analysis people and and uh, stuff like artificial intelligence and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I did a lot of Navy stuff that I learned stuff I didn't want to know and things like that. So eventually I got a job and I came back to NOAA in Seattle in the mid 70s. And at first I was in looking at projects on estuaries, but then we got involved in uh, oil spill studies in Alaska. And then I kept seeing we were doing all kinds of research with ornithologists and, and biologists and geologists about the environment and what would happen if there was an oil spill. But nobody knew anything about oil spills. Was this before oh. Exxon Valdez? Oh, yeah. Okay. This was long before that. And uh, so I suggested we should have a research spill. And they said, research spill? You mean us dump oil? And then they told me I would couldn't study it because I'd be in jail. <laughs> and uh, so I said, wait a minute, we're the government. We give ourselves a permit, right? No, wrong. And so they said, we're going to not give, we couldn't possibly give you a permit till you proved there was no other way to solve this problem. And why don't you just go to spills when they happen? And I said, no, oh, that's a strategic air command mentality. Uh, you uh, would have people up in airplanes flying around all the time. And the, the Murphy's Law would say you're always in the wrong place, all that. And they said, we'll prove it. So we went down to Santa Barbara where there was a, a uh, permanent oil sp spill because of the seeps down there. And we got together and the rules were we couldn't use any equipment. We couldn't ship as excess luggage and we couldn't do any work except out of a Cessna uh, 170, which was uh, a plane that was uh, certified to fly with the doors off. And so we designed current probes, you know, dye things that we throw out. And we did a lot of it. And what astounded us was how much we learned. And we said, uh, gee, this is really interesting. There was about 10 of us in this group. And that was the original SOAR team spilled oil research. And it was Coast Guard, NOAA, uh, their resource people, and environmental research labs. And so we, this was at uh, Thanksgiving, and we were all thinking, well, we'll go home and uh, think about it and meet after Christmas and figure out what to do. Well, the next month was the Argo Merchant. And when the Argo Merchant happened, we had three people on scene the first day in Cape Cod. And the on scene coordinator, who was a Coast Guard captain, looked at us for a little bit and said, You guys know it? And we said, Yeah. He said, Have you ever read the National Contingency Plan? And we said, no. <laughs> he said, you're in it. <laughs> and you are supposed to provide information to me. You're on my staff, period. <laughs> and from that moment, we started doing overflights and learning more about what we didn't know. And because the spill occurred in uh, Senator Kennedy's area, this got big time in the press. <laughs> and the rest is, as we say, history. Uh, did that make you guys the first scientific support coordinator? Yeah. We, well, not quite. I mean, we were still the SOAR team, but people on the Coast Guard strike team got to know us. And the head of the strike team was a guy I'd spent time with in Alaska on icebreakers. And he and I were pretty good friends. 
and he was head of the strike team by that time. So in the next six months, I got called personally by him because he knew I would be helpful. And so totally outside the organization, we were suddenly involved in spills. And no, it wasn't, uh, you know, most of our early calls were from wives and Coast Guard people who happened to have our phone number and they'd see something on the on TV and call us. And so we started going to spills. But one of our SOAR team members uh, decided he was going to become a lawyer. And so he started working on the uh, Clean Water Act, or I forget which it was. But anyway, they rewrote the National Contingency Plan and put in that NOAA would supply a uh, on-scene coordinator uh, science support. And so we we were declared scientific support coordinators, but immediately there was a squabble in, um, in NOAA about who was in charge. And the, uh, the weather service said, we do forecast, that means us. So we're in charge. And fisheries said, no, 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 nobody cares about oil. We care about fish. So we're the target organism. We're in charge. And uh, this argument went on until somebody said, how much money is there in this? <laughs> and they said, none. <laughs> And then they didn't want anything to do with it. Yeah, immediately they lost interest. And it turned out that we had money because John Robinson had us working on the Outer Continental Shelf Alaska oil problem. And they had a lot of money that Department of Interior was putting into this. And they were perfectly happy to support the spilled oil research. And so for a long time, we did research funded by uh, Department of Interior, BOL, BLM, in those days. And uh, that kept us going to spills. And I, working in NOAA as Bass, became a wholly owned subsidiary of the spill biz. <laughs> That's the way it went. Meanwhile, we were doing something pretty unusual in that we were both going to spills and doing research on spills. And an awful lot of people who did research didn't do response. And it turned out that that was critical for us because it was easy for us to really see what the problem was. I mean, we'd be there and literally we developed a home team away team strategy where our field research people every night got on the call back to the, the home team and said, here's what we need. And they were changing the model and introducing new stuff and grabbing new data in real time during the spill. And that was fundamental in our getting better. And I used to get laughed at because one of my sayings was that uh, we all deserve the right to be smarter later. <laughs> That's a good one. Hey, all it was a good one because I used to get tagged all the time at press briefings about, wait a minute, you didn't say that yesterday. <laughs> and, and, and I'd say, well, I'm smarter now. <laughs> and that was the truth. We were learning as we went along. Eventually, we got pretty good at it, but one of the things that nobody seemed to pick up on very well, and I think it's still a mistake, is that our models were not forecasts. They were information pieces that were to go to a forecaster. So a person would interpret the models and then give a briefing. And let me give a good example. The models that worked on triangles were 
that we developed after the triangle routines were things like cats. And cats, and then there was sack and DAC and WAC, which were all triangle finite element routines that resolved shoreline and bathymetry. And they were part of this quick. And by that time, we'd actually got around to like a half an hour response time for our first model. Are you and, still running it on the Apple II at this point? No, no. At this time, we were actually using uh, an IBM machine, which had an Apple chip. <laughs> and so we had machine language mixed with C. And by that time, we were doing C++. And uh, actually, Glenn was still running in Fortran. So it was a bit of a hodgepodge. But we were all, we were totally portable. By that time, I had a little Mac, you know, little Mac cubes. And we were taking those to spills. And we were actually running parallel processing by setting eight of them together. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we'd split the problem up and, and run it that way. So that's we, one way to have an eight core processor. We had an eight core processor. And the people used to joke, I used to run programs where at the end of the day, I went around and put a program on everybody's Mac. And we had 30 of them in the office. And the next morning, I just said, hand this floppy drive to a mass. And then we'd have 30 machines that would run all, all night on uh, problems. But anyway. Uh, so, and, are, and are you call are you calling the application GNOME at this time or what is? Uh, no, no, we didn't call them GNOME. In those days it was called uh, Awesome, OSSM, on-site spill model. So Awesome was was the precursor to, uh, to uh, GNOME. And did anything come in between? No. Okay, so you're running Awesome, you're running it on the the Mac, you've created your own eight core processor. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, but we, we were doing all kinds of things like that. But again, our simple models, SAC, DAC, and WAC, would answer fundamental questions a forecaster would care about. And for example, in an estuary, and consider Puget Sound, and we're talking about, uh, say, uh, Burrard Inlet. One of the critical things you'd want to know if there was a spill there was what the excursion is for a tide. So if you knew where the where you had an overflight at high tide, you'd want to know how far it'd go by ebb tide. The models were really good at that kind of stuff. They weren't terribly good at all the details. So you shouldn't necessarily believe everything the model said, but you could take quite a bit of faith in their excursion. Okay. Another typical thing that you'd wanna know is suppose you're over at Grace Harbor and there's a spill like the Nastaka, which was offshore, but near the mouth. And you wanna know when the tide floods into Grace Harbor, what's the, what you'd simply call the inhale distance. How close would you have to be before it sucked that oil in? You have the same problem in, say, um, Everett, where you got a spill in Everett Harbor. How close would you have to get to Steamboat Slough before it sucked that oil into the marshland? And those are the kind of things that the models were very good at telling you. So we used them that way, but we never really counted on them being handed to somebody as a forecast. Okay, so it wasn't the product you used at the briefing. That's correct. And we thought, you know, we have to have somebody who really understands the oceanography and the strengths and weaknesses of the model. Well, about this time, we decided we should really make this a modern application and we started GNOME. While we started GNOME, one of the things that Glenn did was start looking 
at how you could put the advantage of all these super models that were around that were now uh, run on supercomputers. And they were basically the big GFDL basin wide paraclinic models. What a lot of people don't know is those models typically represented 200 person years of development. I mean, there were huge things that had gone on multi decades at research universities. And the very first ones were all typically done at UCLA or the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab in Princeton. And they were modeled after the atmospheric models. But the atmospheric models didn't have to worry too much about boundaries. On the other hand, oil spill models really did. And we had a good solution for the near shore. And they had a pretty good solution for the deep water. But the in-between was a, a crummy interface. And actually, the, the big models were getting better, and ours were getting faster. And so Glenn started working on sucking in these big models. And so then that, that did the go stuff and, and Glenn started interfacing to where he could bring in dozens of these models from the Navy, like the ones you're working with and we work with all the time. Basically, those are basically Padma and Princeton based models. Okay, yeah, I mean, I dig into these I, I kind of live over in in goods, and I'm often wondering where some of these models come from. Like the yeah. Oregon Coast Ocean Forecast has data that I can use in Puget Sound. You wouldn't think that from the name. Yeah, well, they, there's there's lots of these now, and none of them were available uh, 20 years ago. And the ones that were available, say, for example, on Deepwater Horizon, are uh, obsolete by now. Now, the, these supermodels come with good things and bad things. One of the bad things about them is they're so good with nonlinearities that they actually capture all the atmospheric issues about chaos. And so these models, you know, just the atmospheric models have high low patterns, these big uh, uh, Rossby waves. And those are chaotic. If you run an atmospheric model, it breaks up into stuff that's statistically stable, but individually not. And every, every model that you run stays hooked to the initial conditions for about six days. And that's how long a forecast is good for. And no matter what, how super the atmospheric model is, the chaos drifts away from reality in about six days in the atmosphere. Okay, I didn't and know that. It does. And so the point sort of is that past six days, they can only deal with statistics. And so these hurricane forecasts, for example, try and uh, use five different models and they run all of them and then take an average. <laughs> and basically what they're doing is that they call it an ensemble method. But basically what it is, after six days, there's some sort of a situation space out there that we think we can wander around in, but that's not a forecast. Okay. That's a, for instance, Okay, so the, the uh, ocean models have the same deal, except for two things. One of them is the Rossby waves in the ocean are about 100 kilometers, so it's a much finer scale. And they're the mesoscale eddies that everybody sees. If you look at these models, they're just full of little 100 kilometer eddies. And there's been dozens of observational programs that confirm that, and they are chaotic. Now, once in a rare while, 
there are places where the chaos is limited because of physical processes. One of them would be boundaries, shorelines, convergent zones because of freshwater and uh, saltwater. For example, if you have a spill in Cook Inlet, everybody knows the spill will end up in the Calgon Rip. <laughs> and anybody who fishes in that area knows damn well that in two cycles, all the oil will be over off Calgon Island. You have the same thing going on uh, in the freshwater lens off the Ashafalaya in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that's a, a near shore boundary between the Mississippi runoff freshwater and the saltwater in the Gulf. And like the um, spill of the Alvinas, where the oil got trapped in there and didn't spread out at all for 120 miles, so it got to Galveston. <laughs> and so, you know, people who work with spills and understand those processes can use the model. People who don't are gonna be confused. So we're still to the place where the models are good. They present very realistic pictures and they're for instances, if you go past a few days. So you still need overflights. You still need trained observers. You still need forecasters. On the other hand, if you're doing, for instances, call that a drill. And if you are trying to put together a project to exercise people for the span of situation space that you might expect, then these are very good models. So as long as you realize the, the limitations, I'm a real fan of people using these to plan with and learn with and know things about. On the other hand, for, for real life, you need real input. And the test for this real input is how long will the model give you results that depend on the initial conditions? Let's say if I did an overfly and give you an answer, uh, how long is that answer dependent on the overfly? And I'll give you an example. Suppose that you have a diffusive state like uh, the ocean. If you throw things in the ocean, they spread out and they're always going to spread out. And a good example would be the spill uh, associated with the tsunami in Japan. When that spill occurred, there was a whole lot of crap that got thrown in the ocean. And it all, we knew right where it started. So we could run a model which had initial conditions as it all started in, in right where that spill was. And a year and a half later, it was all over the Oregon coast. The problem is that we had long degenerated into chaos. And we could have started that spill any place in Japan or the Philippines or the Illusions and still got the same answer on the Oregon coast. So that's not a forecast. That doesn't tell you that that crap that came in from the spill or from the uh, tsunami went here and meant that the ocean's dispersive. We had the same problem in Deepwater Horizon when a very sophisticated model in, in Colorado uh, showed that the oil would spread all over the Atlantic and eventually get in the equatorial Atlantic down off Africa. Which it did not. It, which of course it didn't, well, it did in one part per trillion. Okay, all right. But the point sort of was, is that there was no connection between the source and the distribution at the end. And 
So if the answer is chaotic, if the answer is diffusive, then the model can't tell you past the point where it, it diffuses. And so you need a way to evaluate that. There is a way to do that. And Ren and I, and Debbie Payton, actually wrote a paper on that. And it was an AMOP two years ago. And uh, I don't think very many people read that paper, but they ought to. And uh, so- and where, can, and where can we find it? It's an AMOP, the proceedings. Unfortunately, a lot of people that read it sort of scratched their head. It's fairly mathematical. But basically it's based on information theory like they use in communication and cryptoanalysis. So how much it, math do I have to have to read the paper and understand you, you, it? You, you put on how much you want to take on faith. Most people who casually look at it are appalled. The things I say are true and they're easily observable. And a good example would be the two I just gave you, the tsunami and the deep water horizon. Now, there's a good side to this. Things like the Nikiski convergence, the Calgon rip, things like the inhale distance, those are all geometrically tied. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these all over the ocean. They're referred by the euphemism of, um, what do they call them? Uh, Lagrangian structures, coherent Lagrangian structures. And so the the sort of code name in the literature for these processes are called coherent Lagrangian structures. And people have mapped them. They're the good one in the uh, Gulf spill that was the tiger tail. And people always talked about the, uh, the loop current. And between the loop current and the rest of the circulation in the Gulf, there was a convergent zone that just sucked in the oil and stretched it out. And so in the forecast, we'd see the thing going that way. In the other flights, we'd go out and see the thing that way. We'd throw in buoys and they'd go and turn it in that way. And the bottom line was the tiger tail was real and coherent Lagrangian structures counter chaos. So chaos spreads things out coherent Lagrangian structures sucks them in. And if you think of the Calgon rip as a convergence, it's like, think of a bathtub and you pull a plug, you know, stuff's going horizontally this way and down, right? So where does it all end up? At the drain. <laughs> so when you have coherent Lagrangian structures, they all have characteristic that they have vertical motion. And people can start mapping those. Those are like inhale distance. Once you know one lives there, that's part of your forecast. And it may be chaotic. There are certainly times when we said, there's an eddy out there. We know there's an eddy out there. And we find that uh, 10 out of 12 observations of satellites showed the eddy. Two times, one there. That, by the way, is the statistics for the eddy off the Copper River, which makes a big difference if you happen to be a Copper River fisherman. Right, or a salmon trying to get home. Yeah, right. So, or if they spilled oil, where it's going to get trapped. So anyway, they, they, those are the kinds of statistics that you need a forecaster for, but you should be aware of these processes of dispersive things and collective things, or I, ca I call them dispersive events and clustering events. But anyway, uh, the, the models are good because some of them show that, some of them show physical processes, which then you can un understand why they work. At any rate, GNOME has come a long way. It's uh, very much faster. My latest triangle routine now runs on my Oh, five-year-old, not particularly fast uh, laptop. And uh, I can do 10,000 points in five seconds. 
What are you running for a laptop today? Uh, that's what, oh, I haven't tried today, but it's about. No, it's, what, what is your five-year-old laptop? It's a, a Unix box. Oh, okay. I, I run I run the Unix, but it runs the same on the Mac, a five-year-old five Mac. But so anyway, but it turns out that's not a problem anymore. We can handle triangles to a higher density than you can even use. So we have to have thinning routines for the bathymetric data, which we do. And there's a program that we use. It used to be called DOGS, <laughs> which was digital, digital optimization. I don't know. But anyway, it, it, it's another triangle routine. So the value of the model is really about the data that you can put into it. Noah put up the goods web page here a, a few years back and I use it. Where are they you, getting the data? No point, no point that you can use it well, especially if you're doing planning. If you're not doing planning, then you should be aware of its limitations. And one of the questions you should fire bang instantly at the on-scene coordinator, their, your, your NOAA representative is tell me about what overflight data you have, and what are you seeing with regard to uh, clustering events and dispersive events? They should know that. If they don't know that, then you ask them why they don't know it and what they're planning to do to discover it in their observation program. What kind of input is available to someone like the scientific support coordinator when they're trying when they're using overflight data that wouldn't be available to someone like me when I'm just doing inputs for the, for the problem and... the difference is timing. If you were at the command center wearing one of the environmental people badges, so you could uh, sit and talk or listen over the shoulder to the scientific support coordinators briefing coming back from the observers or if they're going out for the observations. You know, listen to what the shoreline people are saying. Listen to what the overflight people are saying. Listen to what the remote sensing people are saying. Those are the data that they use to put together the initial conditions. Okay. Where are they getting their prime movers, the current models? Oh, and... uh, th that comes from NOAA. And it's just, there are people at NOAA, I think still, who do sack, dack, and whack. <laughs> and they certainly use the big, the big models. And, you know, the trick is like sack and dack and whack moves really good for the shoreline stuff around the Birchfoot Delta in the, in the Mississippi, but the big uh, GFDL models don't do very well, but there are specialized models that do better. And uh, Texas A&M has some, and, and so you just need to sort of know about those and know whether they've got them and how often they get updated. And not all of these models that they're using are available off the goods website. They're getting them from other places, right? Exactly. And the other thing too is, for example, the, the uh, really most impressive looking model that was available for the Mississippi Delta, bird's foot with all the freshwater inputs, stuff like that was running off monthly average climatological rainfall. So it was a statistical model, plain and simple. <laughs> and no matter what it said was going on, it was the average of statistical rainfall. And so you, could, you had to be careful how much you say, oh, it's going this way today. Not true. It's going this way on the average. So if you had, you know, spills every year for the last 20 years. <laughs> this might give you an average, but I won't tell you what to taste it. But it might give you, it would give you the place that you might initially fly to for your overflight. Exactly. And then and start it might, hunting and packing. It might give you a pretty good estimate on, on uh, inhale distance, things like uh, 
a tidal excursion, stuff like that. You, it wouldn't be worthless. It, it means you shouldn't dismiss it. Just know its limitations. When did you guys first decide to build location files? I mean, there's like 15 or 20 of them now, right? You can download off the NOAA website. Well, the truth is we had hundreds of them for awesome. Oh, I want hundreds. Where are my hundreds of location files? Well, we started with, in awesome, we started to notice that we were getting called back. You know, this was the second spill we had there. And so we didn't have to digitize anything. We just grabbed the old files. And so Glenn started a library. And, and literally, we had hundreds of places already done. And then it was a matter of, of how to get a file system. But we did that. And Awesome also allowed for zooms. So if we had this area in high resolution, then we could embed that in a bigger resolution, in a you know, larger resolution. And so we could couple three of them together in a heartbeat. So anyway, I, we did all that. But when we did Dome, we said, we should do the same thing. But the trouble with GNOME was an awful lot of people were losing GNOME who had no idea that it wasn't a forecast. They didn't know it was advice. They thought it was a forecast. So we said, we've got to be a whole lot more careful about doing location files as opposed to awesome location. In the old days, in the awesome location files, we used to have all our responders do one, one a month just to stay current. We thought about doing that for GNOME, but then we said, hey, no way, there's too much work. You got to think of all the caveats and write all the basically AI quips that we had developed a good feeling for with Cameo, our, our oil spill problem thing, we had to we had to tell first responders of the things don't believe. And so our location files got very much uh, slowed down because we didn't have the time and people to work on them. So do you guys ha have location files that are put together that you use internally that aren't publicly available? Uh, I think so. Glenn, do we have any? Or not Glenn? Yeah. Red. No, yeah, Noah has a bunch of them. Like we, I've been doing some work recently for some overflight maps that are being produced for a bunch of exercises going on around the country. And I get the GNOME data from Jeff Langford at who works for NOAA currently, and then turn those into overflight maps, for example. So there are, he he sends me a save file, which is a GNOME file. And I go through and run that through GNOME and GNOME Analyst and then into ArcGIS. I'm a, a bunch of, we, we've used their models of starting points, but then we, we go through and add the AI ourselves. Okay. So what does it take to create a location file? Like I told you, I'm still using, or until WebGNOME came out and I found a, a current model that I don't know how accurate it, it is, but it makes the oil move. So that's really uh, good enough well, for it, drill purposes. It's probably great for, for drill purposes. Yeah, for drill purposes. Like I said, I, uh, I was surprised, but I end up using this, uh, this Oregon coastal ocean forecast because it has data that goes all throughout the, the Puget Sound yeah, and, uh, and up, up into British Columbia. That was a very ambitious project started by them about five years ago. But it's a, it's a good a good source. It seems to be the one that works the best for for me, nothing else. Oh, and then I found a model. I don't remember which one it was, but uh, um, maybe it's the same one that actually was able to work as the mover all the way up the Columbia to the first dam and in the, in the Willamette too. So I used it for drill purposes for an oil that's spill, that, that, that's the same model. model. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a that's my go-to current model. Early location files of that, 
because we had a uh, a spill warrior rock uh, years ago on the Columbia. So we had a lot of awesome files <laughs> for 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 the uh, up to Bonneville. <laughs> Can you still run awesome? No. I don't. I mean, I think we could, but uh, it was line printer graphics. And again, silent 700, so nobody would want to. <laughs> when did you guys decide to make GNOME Web? Uh, that was uh, something that started after, after I left. Uh, and basically, the kind of prime mover on that was Chris Barker. And he basically wanted to run a, uh, a Python interface for GNOME. And that was the, the genesis of, uh, of web, web GNOME. So where does one go to find these mover, these prime mover files? I mean, we get the ones that are listed on goods and I really appreciate that they put this good website together. But if you're the scientific support coordinator, where else do you go to look for data? Do you guys, does NOAA have a catalog of data models that they can reach out to try to use? It's really a moving target. A lot of people that have models like this, <laughs> I keep going back to this, one from uh, Colorado on the Deepwater Horizon. People have models who don't themselves know how to use them. <laughs> and you gotta be kind of careful of that. After that model came out, I was approached by uh, GFTL Princeton. And they said, this is a hazard. Well, how, how can we know how to use our models better? And we, we did a really good, uh, thought experiment on how to do it. And they actually ended up writing paper on it. And I think everybody in the lab there was on the author list. I think I was off of 25 or 26. Ren and Debbie were probably also on it. But, but at any rate, there are people who, who understand this problem and try and work on it. But there are also people who don't. So I, I don't know what to tell you there except it is a sort of buyer beware market. <laughs> okay. So we just, if we, if we need a special model, we call Ren. Ren, are you, do you have your own list of where these models reside? No, I just steal what Jerry's already done or he helps me figure out how to put something together. Well, we've known how to extend a bunch of models. Yeah. And actually we also occasionally get things that, that weren't on the public list that Jeff Langford has done. Yeah. They're, they're what you might call um, pre-location files. If you run it in the uh, not expert mode, there's a whole bunch of caveats that say, don't believe this or be careful with this and so forth. Uh, as long as you understand those, ha ha have at it. Well, I generally want it to go to a specific place yeah. for the exercise. So the, I, I end up with the, with the uh, current prime mover uh, working based on the location file, but end up uh, tweaking the wind file to drive it where I need it well, to go. Almost everybody does that. Yeah. I mean, what else can you do? I mean, I, I don't want it to go on to Guimas Island. I want it to go across to, to James and to yeah. uh, Decatur, right? Yeah. Uh, it's easier to do that because it's easier to blow the wind than to create two moons or something for the for the for the super tide or whatever. Right, yeah, two moons. That'd be awesome. So well, thank you, Jerry. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk about this. That's fascinating. I didn't know about uh, awesome. I didn't know that it existed or that it was the precursor to GNOME. <laughs> yeah, we uh like I said, uh, 45 years, we've come a long way. My first personal computer was an abacus. <laughs> an abacus? <laughs> Fo followed by a slide rule? Yeah. Well, I have a slide rule, too. <laughs> yeah, like I said, mine was a K-Pro 4 with two five and a quarter inch floppies and a little, well, like a four, maybe it was a six inch 
uh, uh, screen mm -hmm. and it was in a metal case and you would unclip the keyboard right. from it. But and so that was that was portable, right? It weighed about forty pounds. Yeah, I think we we uh, we looked at those. <laughs> the, the reason uh, the reason we went with the Mac was it was smaller. Yeah, and we also kn knew how to uh, write uh, machine language code for its CPU. And then when we ended up buying an IBM, we bought it and. And the government had to specify why it was this was the only thing you could buy. Was we bought it because it had an Apple chip. <laughs> right. During that brief period where Apple let other manufacturers produce hardware that ran yeah, there was a, ran, yeah, ran the Mac yeah, software. It called, I can't remember what the what the, even the name of the model was, but it was twice as three times as heavy as a, a the Mac, the Mac, but a whole lot faster. And, and probably, it had, I'm probably a little cheaper too. And it had a graphic screen. No, it wasn't cheaper. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's when we started going to a graphic screen instead of line printer stuff. And then they came out with a Mac. And uh, so we went to that little guy. <laughs> Well, that's all the time I've got for today. We're done. We're done. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jerry. That was great. Thank you, Ren, for helping us put this together and setting up the internet connection. Okay. Ren and I are going skiing back there. Oh, excellent. <laughs> you have to hike up there, though. Yeah. Helicopters. That's right. That's right. Have them drop you up there. Exactly. <laughs> not, right. from, not from too high, I hope. No. Not at all. <laughs> okay. Bye. All right, thanks, Bye. Dan. Well, that was a great episode. I didn't know what I didn't know. I feel a lot smarter about trajectory modeling. If you enjoyed the show, please send a tweet, put it on Facebook, or just mention it to a colleague. Stay safe and go back to work.